Hello and welcome to this video on how a virus inserts its genome. This is the process that allows a virus to reproduce and leave a lasting signature in species many millennia if not millions of years later. Viral genome insertion is properly called genome integration but for this video we will stick to the easier understood insertion. This is a process that must happen as a virus cannot reproduce outside of a host. This is why viruses are considered a not living creature. Even if a virus enters a cell, that alone is not enough. It needs to have its gene copied to create more virus. The only way to do this is to make it part of the host organism or cell's genome in many cases. That is to say, part of the DNA of the host. We know that this happens for a number of reasons. The first and most obvious is genetic testing for viral genes in a host. Viruses have very specific genes that do not exist in other creatures. If they're present, the virus has had its genome incorporated. The next is genome sequencing, and this finds that hosts have been exposed to some sort of virus at some point, even if they themselves as an individual had never been exposed to that virus. This means that at some point back in evolutionary terms, there was a time in which one of their ancestors was exposed, survived the exposure, and now we see it in the next or if not many generations later. This is what has happened with the monarch butterfly. The next way to see this is that when a virus is around, a cell like a bacterium, it will kill the host cell, but more viruses are made. This does not happen if no host is available. It is rather like the Gould of Stargate. For the purposes of this video, let's assume that a generic virus exists. It enters the cell, and that that cell will play host via any one of the many different pathways. For this video, those pathways are not relevant, but be aware that it must get through not only the cell membrane or wall. Once in the cell, it must also pass through and into the nucleus. That is the separation or partition between the DNA containing part of the host cell and the rest of the cell. Again, let's assume that this happens as it is, but be aware that this also has barriers that should prevent foreign genetic material from entering. The most immediate example for things like this is coronavirus, and one of the most immediate barriers for that is that it is made from RNA, and the RNA generally needs to be converted into DNA first if it's going to be integrated. Integration is done by reversing the process used to express genes. The gene in the virus finds a match, or at least a close enough match, that it can be able to be matched to it during the replication process and this has a particular quirk. Alternatively, it could find a site that allows for gene insertion, such as a transposon site. The first and second of these is used to match the gene against the virus gene. When the DNA is unwound from the histone spool and opened for replication, the gene is exposed. When the gene being exposed, expressed or copied is similar to the viral gene, it can use the viral gene as a template instead. This leads to it being copied instead or alongside the original gene. The alternative to this particular approach is transposons. This is where and when a viral gene is copied alongside the normal human or host gene. Transposons vary quite a bit, but for the most part you can summarily describe them as the copying of a particular sequence, the uh, reverse transcription of a particular gene, or where neither of these are happening, instead you get a particular part of the genome broken up and spread throughout it. The last of these is not very effective when it comes to viral genomes. The alternative approach to this for transposons is for what is called a cut and paste transposition. And this is theoretically meant to take a gene from one location, and nearly always only for DNA, and move it somewhere else. The difficulty with this is that because you have both a copy and a paste function, 
Theoretically, the original site, if there's no backup site available to move it to, will simply end up with two copies of the same gene in that location. If it doesn't work out that way, it can cut that gene out and move it to somewhere new entirely, with polymerases filling in the resulting gap. The duplication process is the more significant concern when we're talking about the continuous replication and production of viral genomes. This is because during the S phase, or the phase in which a cell is meant to replicate the DNA, the site can be continuously added onto. And so you can get replications of a viral gene repeatedly coming out of the same location. But once the virus has been effectively inserted, the genome that is present does two important things. The first is to produce proteins and other machinery to continuously copy the genome of the virus, and it is to make the necessary viral products for it to be able to infect new hosts. In terms of the latter option, the necessary mechanisms of a virus in order to infect a new host involve creation of proteins. You need these in order to activate the various channels, gateways, and portals that are on the membrane of a cell that let the virus in. If the virus can't get in, it cannot infect the new host. The second is creating the necessary genes and whole genome that is going to go into that virus. These then get chaperoned to where they need to go by various chaperone molecules, and then these are secreted out of the host until eventually the host dies. Depending on the kind of virus we're talking about, there can be a number of things that happen, and it all is based on the kind of genetic material we're talking about. Is it a double or single-stranded DNA virus? Is it made from RNA? Is it single-stranded RNA, double-stranded RNA, and so on? For the purposes of this video, we will provide a very brief rundown of each of these, starting with double-stranded DNA. Double-stranded DNA viruses don't actually need to be inserted into their host. In theory, all the genes they need, not only for transcription and translation, but just to be able to do what they need to do and survive, are located in those two strands of DNA. If they can get into the nucleus, they can activate the machinery of the host cell and keep replicating and transcribing everything they need from themselves. No incorporation or insertion is needed. Single-stranded is a slightly different. Similar, but different. It does need to use the cell's machinery, and this means the host must be able to work with this particular bit of DNA. Without that, you can't get it acting as a template, and the host cell cannot create a copy based on that template. This means that it will not have any of the necessary machinery encoded within its genome. That makes it much smaller than double-stranded DNA. Double-stranded RNA with a positive sense is slightly different in that it acts very much similar to a double-stranded DNA. But remember, RNA by itself cannot be incorporated directly. Rather, it acts solely as a template. And so, the double-stranded RNA is fundamentally used as a signal for the cell to start making particular things. It's also able to use the cellular machinery within the host cell to copy the RNA and create more RNA as a template. The template is then used not only to create those products, but to also act as the genome for the virus once it leaves the host cell. Negative sense or single-stranded RNA works very much in the same way as positive sense RNA works that's double-stranded. The only difference is, for the most part, that it must create a full-length copy of the genome of the virus that is positive sense, that is read forwards, and from here, that acts as the template for all future negative sense copies of the virus that are what will make the actual virus itself. The next group will be those that are based on taking RNA, but have to have DNA as the intermediate. So as we mentioned, this is the primary example that we're familiar with, and it's the one that's going to lead to longer term 
evidence in the terms of evolution or genomics. What you get is RNA being retrofitted or turned back into DNA via transcriptases. By doing this, that can then be used to create more RNA going forwards. The final group we have for you is double-stranded DNA, but that in turn uses RNA as an intermediate. This does exactly the same sort of thing as the last group, which involved the use of single-stranded RNA to create a DNA intermediate. The difference here is that because we're talking about double-stranded DNA, you use the RNA as a sort of temporary bridge or means of creating the DNA genome within the virus particle itself, essentially reversing the process of creating RNA inside the virus or transcribing it back into DNA. This is useful if you're trying to deal with relatively unstable DNA or RNA. DNA is somewhat more stable, and therefore, at least in theory, by only changing things around at the last moment, you can avoid any particular problems. It's worth remembering that for all of this to happen, a virus must have certain proteins on its surface. These are your fusion proteins. These are what allow your virus to bind to its host. Without these, the envelope or cell membrane cannot match together, and you cannot deliver the genome of the virus into its new host. Without this, you do not have infection of a new host, and you do not have the virus being replicated, and therefore the virus is stopped in its tracks. While yes, there are a lot more layers of complexity to how a virus can be copied and replicated inside a host cell, the most well understood and recognized involves incorporation of a virus into the host genome, and this is one that we can better trace, at least throughout historical terms, as we can look at the remains of humans and other species and see if those remains contain DNA, and hopefully enough DNA to see if a virus was incorporated because the host survived infection. If that isn't the case, then we're forced to rely on other methods, and we've described some of those in this video, but hopefully you also understand why viruses can get away with so much, and why they can be so diverse in what they're made from and how they are copied. Not all work the same way, but they do have commonality, if not exactly the same mechanisms in place. Thank you for watching this video. If you have found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions you have below.